right, how are we all doing today? Everybody can hear me? Yeah? Amazing conference, honestly. Just uh, you listen both uh, to the professionals, uh, individuals with uh, presentations and just the uh, casual conversations you're hearing over coffee. I'm, I'm just amazed by the talent uh, that we have. So just a little, uh, give yourself a little pat in the back. Give your person next to you a little pat in the back. We've got, uh, got some amazing stuff going on. So for the, hello, for those who don't know me, my name is Victoria McIntosh. I'm an information and privacy professional here in Halifax. And welcome to You're Going to Need a Bigger Privacy Plan. Here comes the GDPR. I'm going to start uh, by giving a heads up that while I absolutely welcome questions, I absolutely welcome discussion on this topic, I can't take questions until the end of my presentation today. Uh, do keep in mind, I'm trying to give the essence, uh, the need to know, the how do you get started of a 100 article privacy legislation. Uh, there are a lot of points in this, uh, the GDPR where I actually want to talk more, but for time's sake I've had to kind of condense it a bit. Uh, that said, if you want to know more, if you want to talk, uh, hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, certainly I'll be here for the rest of the conference, so come grab me and uh, we can chat, absolutely. Also, in the spirit of time, just a little uh, heads up that, let's see, where is this gonna, oh, you're gonna be nice there, aren't you? Want something. Time is running out. Guess what, we have now have a less than a month before the GDPR comes into force. Comes in on May 25th, 2018. And if you have clients, if you have companies that are saying, great, we need to be in compliance with this, how do we get started? You have the fun part of saying, we are going to do this, but you're not going to make the deadline. Um, I can be a little bit blunt with my clients on this one, not, uh, not to be uh, too rude or anything, but just because it's just not possible. This is a legislation that takes time to prepare for. So it's just use the little, there we go. Uh, Speaking to, I don't know how many people know, uh, Simply Cast is a local business uh, here in Halifax. A really good start, really good group. Uh, they've gone through the exercise of compliance. They've, uh, they took it as a team effort. And uh, I was speaking with the CEO and they were like, yeah, this, this took us a lot longer than we, we expected. We, we were glad we, uh, we started this early. Okay? It, it, it takes time. Uh, there's no quick fixes. So with that in mind, hey, what is the GDPR? Why do Europeans need so much more privacy? Why are they special snowflakes? Why, you know, why is, it, are, you know, privacy? Why do they need this brand spanking big new law that everybody's talking about? They need it because the status quo is not good enough. A couple of stats here, uh, I love data by the way, data governance person, yay. 70% of EU citizens think they should be able to delete personal information stored on a website, 75%. And an equal number, 74%, they understand that they have to give personal information out um, to be part of modern society. So they get it, they say, okay, we need a you know, doctor's appointment, I want a job. Yes, I have to give my information out there, but I should be able to control it. Compare it with the fact that only 40% of companies are confident in where their data is stored. 40% actually knows where the data is. You wanna get another statistic? Uh, so in Europe, they have the right to be forgotten. Uh, again, hitting into that little, uh, we have the right to erase our information. And Google, complies with this about 58% of the time, just over half. In fact, there was a major, uh, they lost a major uh, case in the UK this month. So the honor system is like, okay, it's not working. We have expectations and you're not meeting them. Also critical to understand that privacy is a human right in Europe. And it's been a human right, a basic human right, for a long time, since 1950, okay? 
Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights specifies the right to privacy, the right to privacy of family, the right to privacy of home. Now think about this. 1950, that's been in place. That means anybody who is under the age of 70 has grown up in an environment where they understand that privacy is their right. Whether they agree with it or not, that's what they've been told. That's, that's what they've been taught. And if you're under the age of 70, hey, wasn't there this major event back in like, you know, before 1950? Some guy kind of tried to take over the world, maybe kill a lot of people of different religion, ethnic, uh, ethnicity, sexual orientation, mental abilities, and so forth. Okay? The people who are now, uh, who are beyond this, survived the world wars. So they know how dangerous people can be and how dangerous personal information can be. And of course, one thing I find is often ignored from the uh, discussion, it was time for a change. The last time the EU had a privacy law, it was in 1995. Wow, we didn't have Facebook then. We did not have, you know, half the things we have. Social media did not exist. So it was time for a change. They needed to do something anyway. The fact that certain, uh, certain people and arrangements, uh, Cough Snowden, uh, Cough Safe Harbor, kind of made them aware of, hey, we really got to get in our game here, might have been a factor. So in April 2016, the EU approved the General Data Protection Regulation, which from here on in, the GDPR. And for those of you whose clients, whose businesses think, listen, this is a lot of privacy, this is too much, it could have been worse. Okay, the holdout uh, member states of the EU actually wanted more privacy. Austria, I'm looking in your direction. So what makes the GDPR so dynamic? We're in Canada. We actually have a lot of privacy laws existing in our own country. We have PEPIDA, of course, private sector privacy, for the most part. We have uh, different provinces often have different health privacy legislations. We have privacy at the provincial level. We have privacy at the federal level. We have the Privacy Act for the federal government. So we, are, we actually have a lot of privacy laws and they can get quite, uh, quite complex. What makes the GDPR this amazing, we need to talk about it now kind of legislation? Well, for starters, this is a privacy base for all of the European Union, okay? What this means is your company must comply well, first of all, yes, if you've got an office in Europe, guess what? Uh, whether you're, your head, head office is in Europe, uh, Ubisoft, I don't know how many people here play Assassin's Creed, their head office is in Paris, so they're going to comply. Uh, local businesses uh, here in Canada which have a European office, they are going to comply. Human resources information does fall under the GDPR. If your organization collects EU citizen personal information, Hey, I'm a website owner in Brazil. I sell this product that is really popular with the European market, so I end up collecting people's information. I will be expected to comply. Okay. If your organization is business to business, if you cut process EU sys and PI, including for other businesses, you're in data analytics. Awesome, excellent for you. And you're getting data about European citizens and you're processing it you will be expected to comply. Hopefully, fortunately for you, whoever is collecting that information will probably be knocking on your door and asking you, are you in compliance? And uh, per discussion earlier, no, if you are not for profit, you are not exempt. Uh, it's, uh, you know, too bad, so sad. Uh, you know, gotta get your house in order. If your organization monitors EU citizens, Okay, you're developing a fabulous new Internet of Things device that monitors heartbeats. You're saying, well, we're not processing the information, we're just telling people that their heart rate's starting to slow. You're still monitoring those citizens. You're still accessing that personal space. You need to comply. Stronger individual rights. This is a law that takes privacy of the data subject seriously. The data subject, the individual who is giving you the personal information, has the power in this law. Again, this is not intended out there to be a big cuff on the ear to business. It's not to say, listen, you know, we really got to do something. We got to make things a little more difficult. That, that's not the intent here. 
The intent is for EU citizens to go about their daily business, to sign up for your services, and to know that their privacy rights are being respected from day one. So you've got the right of access. I have the right to see what information you have on me. You're all Canadians, you actually should be in compliance with this one already. It is already in Canadian law. Okay, I have the right to see what you got on me. The right to rectification. Honestly, if you're not doing this one, I question your practices. Right to rectification means that if the data is incorrect, the person can update it. Okay, please have your systems be editable. Make certain that people can give you the right information when you get it wrong. You don't want bad data, and people don't want decisions made on bad data. Okay. The right to data portability. This is a bit of a different one. What this means is two things. One, I'm a data subject, and I want to see my information. You can't go to me and say, well, here's my screen, but I can't give it to you because it's all in this database. You're just going to have to read it while I'm here. It doesn't work. You have to be able to give it to them in a format that they can read. Excel, Microsoft Doc, whatever it is, it has to be exportable to them. The other point is, let's say I don't like your company, and I want to move to another company. I have the right to say, you take that data out of your database and give it to these other guys. It has to be portable. The right to erasure. I won't talk too much about this one because it's often uh, discussed, that right to be forgotten. Um, but again, particularly if you're working in systems, really, this is something on the technical side you're really gonna wanna double check is, when we say that person's information is deleted, is it actually gone, okay? How, you know, or does it just, do we say, oh, well, the profile's gone, but the information is still cycling somewhere. Again, speaking to businesses which have complied, this was an issue. This required some recoding to make certain that they could, they could uh, meet it. The right to restriction of processing. Right to say no. Um, exceptions, of course, to this one, but generally it's like, oh, you have incorrect information on me? Yeah, I don't want you using that. I don't want you uh, processing that. The right, uh, Europe's very heavy on the right to say no, especially if the data is not required for the service. Okay. The right to object to certain data use, very similar. The right to say, again, no, sorry, no dice. Um, one area I really uh, get, like to get into with the right to object the EU covers is the idea of the right to say no to automated processing. So let's say that you have this brand new software which can read resumes and say this is the top 10 people for the job. I gotta tell you, I've worked in an HR firm, they would love this, okay? If you could automate that process and automate and say, look, these 10 people, they are exactly what you're looking for. That's great. But we don't know what went into that software. We don't know the algorithm. We don't know the bias that was created. Well, we don't know the data that it was tested on. We don't know the information that this thing is often using to make a decision and it may be using information which has absolutely nothing for the purpose, okay? Um, algorithms are money to big companies. They don't want to tell us what's in them, okay? They don't want to expose Google, walk up to Google and say, hey, can I take a look at your algorithm? Enjoy the laughter. That's their money. They don't want to tell you. So the EU says, okay, wait a minute. People can at least say no. They can say, you know what? This particular is gonna infect my life you know, applying for a job, applying for a house, applying for money. I want a human being to analyze and make the decision. Doesn't guarantee there won't be bias. Humans are imperfect. Doesn't guarantee the decision will be overthrown. But it does mean at least a level of transparency. And okay, the computer said this, and when a human being looks at my stuff, they agree with it. So where there's not some kind of missing, it's not suddenly looking at my religion and making a decision based on that without me knowing. Limited transfer of data outside the EU. This one gets talked about a lot, the idea of data residency and it has to be in the EU. The good news is you actually can move data outside the European Union. There is uh, permission to do that. It's just that there are much higher standards to do so. Um, Ireland right now I'm here is making big money because they're an English speaking country that uh, has some big data servers so they can say, hey, guess what, we're in the EU already, so we're already compliant, so just send your stuff to us. Uh, but that's not always possible. You're a Canadian business, you may have to send your data to Ontario, uh, to Quebec, just to, by the nature of processing. 
So what the EU says is it says, okay, you can take that data outside, but you have to make certain the right safeguards are in place. Okay? You have to have good levels of security. You have to have certain clauses in your business contracts. Okay? You want to make certain that information is protected. You want to make certain that the data subject rights are enforceable. You can't just send the data to China and say, well, the data's in China right now, different, uh, different laws, different rights, of, uh, different rights, can't do anything. No. Still has to have that right of erasure, uh, that right of uh, rectification of has to be enforced. Okay? Effective legal remedies. Again, I sent that data to Australia. I can't just say, well, the data's in Australia, I can't do anything, even if you hit me hard with a lawsuit. Tough luck, it's in Australia. It is attempting to have a level of data sovereignty. That is to say that the law of the GDPR, the law of the European Union, still applies to that data no matter where it goes. And if you're saying, well, it, it's not possible to enforce that law, it's not possible, then the argument is then that data should not be going out in the first place. So this is an area where it, it like say, if somebody says, oh, well, you can't transfer data outside the EU. No, you can't. But you really got to double check your contracts and make certain that any law of the land of the EU is enforceable with the data you have. Data protection by design and by default. I love this. Okay, and I love you, so I'll tell you why I love this. Because it's a Canadian idea. Who here is, I don't know if anyone here has heard of Anna Kovakin. She is the former privacy commissioner of Canada, and this is her brainchild. This is a Canadian idea that managed to make it into a European law. Woohoo! If that wasn't fun enough, anyone here who has small kids? This is the one, this woman's brother's Rafi. The same guy who sang, uh, sings Baby Beluga to your kids, actually, uh, he himself has written on the light and dark web. So there you go, a little Canadian context for this. On a personal note, I also love privacy by design because, and you're going to love this too as security professionals, it forces businesses to take security and privacy seriously from day one. I cannot create, create a product and go to market and say, well, we can't make it compliant with the GDPR because we didn't think about privacy early enough. You know, we didn't think about uh, these potential security concerns until too late to fix things. Can't do it. Have to start thinking about privacy the moment you start thinking about data collection. So you are getting security and privacy right into the design of the product. Privacy as the default setting for tools, processes, and programs. I can name a few social media ne networks that are gonna absolutely hate this one. I can name a few social media networks that went in front of the Federal Trade C uh, Commission uh, because they violated this one. <laughs> um, what this means is that all those lovely articles you see about how you signed up for a service, now here's to set your privacy, you don't need to do it anymore. Because according to the GDPR, the privacy settings are the default. The protection of your information is the default setting of your product, of your service. Now, you can allow people certainly to share more information, you can encourage them, but if the person decides not to go into that, they don't need to have, they don't need to read dozens of articles to find out how to protect themselves. They shouldn't need to, it's by default. Finally, a big thing that we often talk about with the GDPR is that this is a legislation with T. Okay? You're not in compliance? Fine, fine, fine. Might get a warning. Might get a reprimand. Maybe you get suspension of data. Oh, and you might get a fine of up to 20 million euro, or 4% of your global annual turnover. Big fines on this one. Good news is, uh, both from my own, uh, from a few professional analysis and my own, uh, what I've heard from the European Union Commission, this is a tool that they have. It isn't a tool that they are going to use, and certainly not in everybody. If your business can show that you actively care about privacy, that's going to make a difference. Okay? If your business tells people they have a data breach on time, that's going to make a difference. They actually are not showing a lot of uh, insistence of, we're going to be slapping huge fines left and right. But it's there. And if your business is ignoring privacy, if your business is showing that you don't care, they have this power to cost you a lot of money. 
All right. So we have this brand new privacy legislation. It's coming in a month. It asserts that, hey, data subjects, their privacy rights are your big priority. It tells you where you can put the data, and it gives you some darn good reasons why you want to follow along to this. Where do we get started? What do we do? You know, what contracts do we have to sign or fix? Or, you know, what technology do we have to get in place? Honestly, if I'm starting this thing, I say pick your team. The GDPR is a data governance legislation. Two of the major definitions that come across in this legislation, two things you're really going to know, is you have to be able to say who is your controller and who are your processors. Your controller can be a company, can be an individual, but it's the person who's calling the shots, the person who is making that uh, priority and saying, this is how we're going to handle this. To get into that uh, InfoSec rock star conversation we had earlier, who's the authority who is pushing and saying, we're going to follow this? And yes, there will be a document with my name on it that says that I'm paying attention to this stuff. The processor's name implies, of course, you're processing data. You're working with it. Okay? The GDPR is asking you simply, OK, you've got some personal information. Can you tell me who actually gets to see it? And if you can't, well, then maybe you shouldn't be dealing with this personal information in the first place. Does your organization need a data protection officer? Depends. Uh, if you're a smaller organization and you're not dealing with particularly sensitive data, you may actually not need this. Uh, where the data protection officer comes into place is if you have more than 250 employees, uh, if you're public sector, or if you're dealing with particularly vulnerable uh, special classes of data, health information is a really good example there, you're going to need a data protection officer, which is somebody who knows and understands the law and is not responsible to the controller. Okay, they have a little step back. You want somebody, number one, who understands the stuff. You can't just point to your team and say, you, you're the data pro you know, protection officer. You over there, you're not doing anything. You're a new data protection officer. No. Number one thing here is you need somebody who's trained. They also have to be able to report to management because they are going to be auditing your system. They're going to be that double check saying, yes, we are in compliance. We are paying attention to this. I'm not into the office politics. Good news is, by the way, is your data protection officer can be outside the business. You can hire third parties. You can hire consultancies. Completely legal. Uh, but they say if you're collecting your large, you're collecting a lot of information, you're going to want one of these. Inventory, data, and processes. What types of data do you collect? Why do you process it? And where is it kept? And how do you get consent? These are all questions that you should be asking because they are all going to come up. Okay? Uh, what types of data you t do you collect? The GDPR uh, classifies data in terms of special classifications, expectations. So a person's, again, I use health because it's obvious, uh, financial information, a person's eth ethnicity may need to have more care than just say the name and email and address. Okay? Uh, consent, where I really see consent being interested, there's implied and there's explicit, but there's also a level of what's your relationship. So for example, you're offering somebody a job and you want some information you're going to have to process. GDPR completely is, uh, it gives you uh, loopholes for this. But you can't say, I also want to, you know, hook a little transmitter on you and watch where you go. And I want you to agree this of your own free hand. Click, here's a gun. I'm not going to give you the job unless you agree. GDPR does have that power balance of, okay, is it, is it really they consented or was it, you know, they, uh, they had no choice? Controller processors, record of data processing. Again, once you've identified that controller and your processes, there are documents they are expected to create. Uh, particularly in terms of who they are, what types of data they're processing. Documented instructions for processing. Hey, controller, what is your team actually allowed to do with that data? What are they not allowed to do? Okay, Are you okay with people just flipping through records? In some cases, it may be. You may say, look, our job is to find out people who have symptoms of heart attack and tell them. That's fine. But that has to be in your instructions that they're allowed to do that. Ooh, this is going to be fun. This is going to be a very fun one to watch. And it's coming to Canada, maybe not in this extent, but it's coming. Data breach planning, be ready. 
Equifax can't happen anymore because under the GDPR, a business now has 72 hours to notify the data subject. That's right, you now have three days to tell people their data has been breached. So guess what? Have a plan in place, for goodness sakes. Do not leave this to last minute. Do not say, well, if we get breached, we'll know what to do. We'll figure it out. Three days, you're going to panic, <laughs> okay? You need to tell the data subjects, and you also have to document the facts for supervisor authorities. If you have a data breach, they're going to be asking, how did this happen? You want to document and say, well, this is what happened. This is how they got in, or how we know they got in. This is how we discovered it, okay? Have that report. And if it seems like I'm saying, wow, this is a lot of documentation with the GDPR, you're right, it is, okay? This is a legislation, this is a, re a regulation that's saying, show me the proof. You're the business, you show me how you're in compliance, okay? I don't want to have to snoop around because somebody said that, hey, this business doesn't take privacy seriously. I'm like, oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. There's our word for it. You've got to show me your proof. How are you doing this? Update your website. I put this on here because it's pretty easy to do uh, for most of us. These are unfortunately not complete instructions as much as I'd like, uh, but we all have websites, okay? We all, uh, we all have sites often. Our market are, is, the, uh, is the GDPR. Many of us have trackers. We like those analytics. Uh, so pay attention there. Uh, active opt-ins. By the way, anyone in Canada here, if you're complying with the Canadian anti-spam legislation, you should have this already, okay? People actively click yes. Okay, options to withdraw consent. No, I'm not interested in hearing your product. Yes, I'm gonna give you my email for the mailing list, but no, I'm not giving it for anything else. Clear privacy notice. You're collecting data, what are you gonna do with it? Clear communications about web tracking. Do you need a better cookies note? Uh, many of you may encounter now websites where they have those annoying little pop-ups that say, we're collecting cookies and are you okay with that? To be honest with you, the privacy community really hates those too, but we're trying to figure out, well, what's our alternative here? Because it doesn't take much to realize that there's a lot of tracking going on and a lot of information being collected on our web browsing habits that there is absolutely no, especially if you're non-tech savvy, people are like, wait a minute, you mean Amazon was tracking every site I went to? What's going on here? Again, this is one of those areas where I would be very curious to see how it goes forth because it's a little bit tricky. But with the GDPR, the idea is, hey, you're visiting my site, you should know that, yes, we are tracking you, and here's how, and here's how you can opt out. Resume, review your security safeguards. I'm sure everybody in the room here is excellent at this, right? This is, this is, your, this is your call. This is where it's like, how do we ha get ready for the GDPR? We're gonna look the heck out of your security and make certain everything's safe, okay? How's your e-discovery and deletion? Does the data need to be pseudonymized or encrypted? Question, does the data need to be encrypted? The answer is yes. Honestly, my answer always, if it's personal information, is yeah, it needs to be encrypted. With the pseudonymization, though, I give a little word of warning. A lot of businesses I've noticed, they think what de-identification is, they don't quite have the same understanding of it. Uh, I've gone into businesses which say, oh, it's okay, all of our data is de-identified. You know, you can't tell anybody. And I'm like, yeah, I see a user ID here. It takes me two seconds to connect that to your database. If the data is really de-identified, it's, you couldn't put, uh, put it back together again. So, heads up, if you're looking for compliance and they tell you the data is de-identified, look at it. Say, could I see a sample of that data? Can I actually see what you're doing? Because that will be a factor there. A system to keep confidenti confidentiality, integrity, availability, and resilience in place. And yes, I'm directly quoting the legislation here. What's interesting is you'll notice I'm not talking about any particular technology. I'm being very generic. Because the GDPR is very generic when it comes to security IT. They're not concerned if you have a preference of platform. There's not a pr uh, prefer preference of tools of what you're doing. The concern is, look, whatever you're doing, just tell me it works. Tell me that uh, the old triangle, that it's confidential, confidential, it's got in uh, integrity, availability. You know, tell me if you, you know, if you left uh, your stuff is out in the wild tomorrow and it's completely goes in the dark, that you can get it back. Regular testing, assessing and evaluating. You're doing vulnerability tests, you're doing penetration tests. Good for you. 
you can help businesses be more GDPR compliant because this is what they need. This is expected. Challenges ahead. Well, even without uh, going any further, I can tell you one challenge is that a lot of people are very curious how this is actually going to go down. Uh, you talk to lawyers, even people who've uh, practiced law in Europe for years, and the answer is, well, this is our interpretation of the text. This is what everybody's saying, but it's a new law, and like all new laws, we kind of have to wait a little bit and see how it's actually enforced. Uh, so that is one challenge that I can tell you already. More directly, however, I'm really curious about the data sovereignty issue. Personally, interest, uh, again, I've, I've, I've talked about data sovereignty before, uh, but the catch-22 is that privacy legislations are really difficult to enforce between countries. Even between Canada and the US, we've had situations where a decision comes down from the Supreme Court of Canada and it's completely overturned in the United States. Okay? This is not an easy thing. And what's more, the GDPR allows individual member states to have stronger requirements. I'm going to take a little step back here and say we actually have this in Canada too. We have PIPITA, but if a provincial legislation says, hey, we have stronger requirements than the PIPITA, PIPITA says you listen to those stronger requirements. The GDPR is the same. If France decides they want stronger privacy legislation, if Italy decides it wants stronger privacy legislation and you do business in France or Italy, you will comply with the French legislation. You will comply with the Italian legislation. The GDPR is the base minimal. It does not take over the ability of individual member states to have their own expectations, their own requirements. Uh, the uh, UK in particular, so the UK will still be part of the European Union uh, when this goes into force. They are leaving. But particularly given the amount of business the UK does with the rest of the, uh, does with the union, they are creating new laws that will be very equal to the GDPR. So a heads up, this is your starting point, but if you're getting a major headway in Europe, take a look at the other laws and make certain there's no additional requirements. Dealing with different privacy mindsets, China versus the EU is the one I highlight here because See, they have such completely different uh, standards. Uh, China says, we want the data of Chinese citizens in China, and we want back doors to the encryption. Government needs to be able to access it. We want to be able to see it. GDPR, EU, and you're going to like this, says, we don't want back doors. Hasn't been legislated yet, but has been on the official radar of they dis disapprove of back doors to encryption. They believe st uh, stronger in the privacy rights of the citizen. And certainly, it would be a mistake, at least to me, to have EU citizen data going to China or Chinese citizen data going to the EU because of this conflict. Problem is, we live in a global universe. We, we, we live in a global world right now. Uh, we have countries which do business all around the world, so this is going to be a very difficult challenge. Uh, I, I really f I feel for Apple right now. I know they're a very powerful company, uh, but uh, they've already said, well, we're going to have to keep some data in China. They're also going to have to comply with the G, uh, e, uh, GDPR. They're going to have some work on their hands. New technology versus privacy de by design. Many of you may have heard about this little tech. You know, it's, it's upcoming. It's called blockchain. I may, I may have heard about it somewhere here. It might be a thing. Here's the thing about blockchain. Uh, it has tremendous potential. Don't get me wrong. I, I've, uh, I've looked into it. I'm very fascinated, particularly if I was in logistics. I would be just like, yes, heck yes, this is good. But blockchain right now, at least certainly everything I've seen, is inherently incompatible with the GDPR because it can't provide that access to individuals about their information, and it definitely can't erase the information. So what are we going to do here? How is this, how is this going to work? And my current answer, again, is either A, hopefully somebody who is a blockchain developer is going to find a way to refine that text so that it does comply with the GDPR, or you're going to have companies who attempt to take blockchain into the EU and be told, look, this is great, but don't you dare collect personal information. Because the minute you start putting personal information into blockchain, if it's a European citizen, you are violating the GDPR law. Compliance versus competition. This happens everywhere. Uh, this happens in Nova Scotia. Somebody uh, from NSBI was telling me about how honey couldn't be imported between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Okay, we always have standards. 
Um, and they are not necessarily meant to punish businesses, but they are, uh, certainly if you're a Canadian, you kind of want the, you want the health food, to, the food to actually have a certain level of safety. So that's what we may see with the GDPR. We may see companies, uh, startups that say, hey, I don't want to take this technology to the European Union. Okay, it's, it's too much trouble, the GDPR is too much of a pain, forget it, I'm just gonna ignore that market. So the question is, are you going to see these EU companies say, well, I want that tech in here, let's see if we can create something that's very similar. Um, are we going to see any competition, any, uh, any clashes, again, uh, between companies which don't need to comply and companies which do? Difficult to say, but I would be very surprised if we don't see a little bit of, uh, little bit of concern there. All right, if you want to know more, uh, background, my background, I've told people I'm a librarian, uh, I have a master's in library and information science, so guess what? I love giving people information. I absolutely, you want resources, hey, uh, send me a call, I'm happy to find. Uh, these are just some of the resources. We've got official text. Uh, EURLEX is the official text. GDPRinfo.eu, which is your top Google search, is not the official text, but it's a lot easier to make your way through it. Uh, we've got infographics, uh, we've got seriously Google GDPR articles, uh, IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Practitioners, they've got entire stuff uh, on this, so there's lots of stuff out there. GDPR and you, Ireland. And hey, so send me an email. Uh, I, have, I, I do coffee a lot, I, I love, uh, I, I do work a lot better when I'm well caffeinated, I'll say that. <laughs> Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. I know we get five minutes. If we have any time for questions or any, uh, do we have time for questions or are we kind of, yeah, okay. If, any questions? Any? Anything? Okay. Yeah, we're going to get the, okay, we get somebody with the mics going around here. Thanks, Larry. It was a great presentation. Uh, are there any um, special provisions for the security industry in terms of monitoring and collecting data on uh, citizens in the EU um, that would give us an exemption under some of the privacy legislation? In other words, is there anything tied specifically to the security practice? Honestly, not many. Usually when I see exemptions under the EU, it tends to mean more of like, okay, you can't legally, for example, process this contract unless you share the information. Or there are a lot of clauses that are for the public good or for the individual's own good. Um, that's, that tends to be where the exemptions are. They don't tend to be by organization, organization type, and more of situational, okay, you know, look, I, I know you uh, want to keep this private, but if we don't tell people, we're going to have a massive outbreak of disease here. We've got we to let them know something's going on here. Uh, that tends to be where the exemptions apply. Uh, we, I will say, in the past, Canada had a really good status. We don't have it, we don't know if we're gonna have it again. I hope we do, but no guarantees. Hi, I had a quick question. You talked earlier about uh, the right to erasure. Mm -hmm. um, how does that apply to backups? As an ops guy, I have backups of everything someone wanted their data erased, do I even have to dig into the backups? Um, honestly, I would look at the existing right to erase your laws to take a look at past, because the good news about that is that we have existing cases uh, where judgment has been passed on it. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, it's the kind of situation where it's catch-22. It's like on the one hand, yeah, you need, those, you need those backups. You need to be able to keep the system up to date. Uh, you have that, uh, not the integrity, the uh, accessibility faction. The hit 22 is you have to ask yourself, what if that backup got in the wrong hands? Uh, what if something happened? We already do have cases, Cough Cambridge Analytica, where they, this is how they were exposed, is because they said, oh, it's a, okay, we deleted the information, and then a whistleblower said, well, actually, no, the information's sitting on a server somewhere. So, uh, again, I unfortunately don't have an easy answer for that one. Uh, I would say, ask yourself in terms of e-discovery, could I hook up that backup and find that person's information? Uh, because that's gonna be a piece of it. Again, the individuals have the right to see their information. Uh, 
but again, uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think saying we're, we have nothing except a backup. Where you're going to have more, uh, more flexibility is if you can say, we have a backup, we are the doc, it's medical information, they are legally required to keep it for 10 years. That's going to be where it's going to be a little bit more acceptable. You mentioned that uh, companies may not want to uh, provide service. There might be uh, new companies for those services in Europe. How would that affect uh, European Union citizens living in, say, Halifax, Nova Scotia? I wouldn't necessarily know that they're EU citizens while trying not to serve EU citizens. I honestly think I'm going to have to give you the, uh, the old uh, case lawyer example of uh, it depends. Under the GDPR, yes, if they're a EU citizen, then their data is applicable to the GDPR. But that does raise a very good question, especially if, again, you have no clue that they are. Um, I would say in terms of fines, uh, that is an area where they might maybe, I don't think they would penalize you for the full amount there because again, it's you were not conscious uh, that these were uh, EU citizens. I will say, however, I question your HR department if they don't know what country the people who you're hiring is. To me, that just suddenly says, wait a minute, you know, do they need a visa? Do they have what's going on there? So I would talk to your HR uh, department first and say, hey, do we ever hire European nationals? Uh, and if we do, we need to get ready. Certainly I'm dealing with at least one company, which they do, and they've realized, yeah, actually, this is gonna apply to us. We're in Canada, but we hire EU citizens. Hi, Victoria. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Just a further follow on with regards to the blockchain technology and that potentially being a, uh, a bad thing for the GDPR. Will, is there any discussion about uh, personnel or, or EU citizens being able to opt out of uh, privacy for any particular tech or anything like that? I haven't seen discussions yet. Um, my opinion when it comes to blockchain is that privacy folks, we have to get caught up. This is coming. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm definitely very careful of saying, well, no, you can't use this tech because it's like, no, the tech's gonna get used. We have to find a way to design it with privacy in mind. Um, having said that, again, I really don't know how, uh, how it's going to come down the pike. I will say again, because Article 25 deliberately says that if you are building a business and uh, the moment you start to thinking about collecting personal information, you are going to be thinking about how privacy is involved. In theory, you should have already had though, you should have been thinking about that. And if you don't know yet, if you're going to sell your product to the EU or not, I don't, Again, I'm a privacy person. I still say, you know what? Odds are it's actually better in your favor to plan for privacy de by design. We have instances where the company that protects your information makes more money. So go for it. Thank you, All right. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>